Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today, we're going to be taking a first look at the upcoming Ambernec Win 600. For sure, this has been a highly anticipated device, and this is Ambernec's first x86 handheld to make it to market. And on paper, this actually looks like a really nice little device. And since it's utilizing an x86 CPU from AMD, we can install Windows or basically any variant of Linux on this unit, including Steam OS. That's something I'll definitely want to test out, and they do advertise this as running Windows and Steam OS. But to tell you the truth, I'm not sure if they were talking about Steam Big Picture in Windows or not, because I don't have official Steam OS firmware for this unit yet, but we can always install a third-party operating system like Hollow ISO. I think it looks like a really nice little handheld. I love the coloring here. I know it's a bit hard to see, but this is kind of a pearl white. And we do have those lime green accents on all of the buttons, but they will be offering a gray version of this also. So real quick, this is also going to come with a 45 watt quick charger. We get our USB type C cable. And yeah, this is a 45 watt wall charger. They've also included a glass screen protector and a user manual. So I definitely want to install this first before I get everything booted up. Taking a look around the device, on the bottom here we've got our speaker outputs. This does use dual stereo speakers. We also have a 3.5mm audio jack down here so we can easily add headphones. Moving over to the right hand side, we've got a dedicated keyboard button and when we press this in Windows it'll bring up the on-screen keyboard. And we've also got a function switch over here which will allow us to turn the built-in controls into kind of a mouse so you can easily navigate your operating system. And when it's time to game, you can set it right back to controller mode and it acts as an X input device. On the right hand side, we've got a volume rocker and our power slash sleep button. And finally, moving around to the top here, we've got a full function USB type C port. This does allow for display out so we can connect to an external monitor. And they've also included a full size USB 3.1 port got our shoulders and triggers but unfortunately the triggers here L2 and R2 are not analog so these are basically it would have been really nice if they used analog triggers up here but unfortunately that's not the case with the Win 600. So far everything's been working really well it's got Windows 10 pre-installed on it so I did some sign in some Wi-Fi setup. Uh, when it comes to the screen, I think it looks really good. It's a 7-inch IPS at 1280 by 720 It's not a super top-of-the-line AMOLED, but I think they did a great job choosing what they have here. Taking a look at the rear of the unit, we've got an intake vent here for that AMD CPU and four screws to remove the back. It's actually really easy to get in here and upgrade the RAM and storage. When it comes to the Win 600, they're actually going to be releasing two different models. The lower end model is going to come with the Athlon Silver 3020E, but the one we have here is the higher end model with that AMD Athlon Silver 3050E. Two cores, four threads, we've got a base clock of 1.4 GHz and a boost up to 2.8. We've got built-in Vega 3 graphics at 1000 MHz and 8GB of user-replaceable SODIMM RAM. This is DDR4 at 2400 MHz right out of the box but it's running in single channel. We've only got one slot in this unit, and as a lot of us already know, with these APUs, running your RAM in dual channel really does help out with that GPU performance. But I've done a little bit of testing, and I was able to take this up to a single 16 gigabyte stick, and from the BIOS, I swapped the speed to 3200 megahertz. So having that faster RAM will help out, but dual channel right out of the box would have been really nice. We've got a 256 gigabyte user replaceable 2242 M.2 SSD, 39 watt hour battery, and this will run Windows or Linux. It's an x86 CPU, so there's a lot of choices that we can go with when it comes to operating systems on the Win 600. I definitely wanted to give you a look at the internals here, and pulling the back off is pretty easy. It does have some clips and four screws, but once you're in here, we can access the battery, the M.2 SSD, and that RAM. So if we ever needed to replace the battery down the road, easy enough to get to, it utilizes a 42mm M.2 SSD. You can get these relatively cheap on eBay and Amazon. And we've got a single stick of SODIMM DDR4. Now this is actually rated at 2666, but once you boot everything up, it's only going to be running at 2400 megahertz. But luckily, we do have basically an unlocked BIOS with this unit. So if you did want to upgrade to, let's say, 16 gigabytes running at 3200 megahertz, it's actually pretty easy to do. I've got a 16 gigabyte stick here that's rated at 3200 megahertz, and this is going to make a difference with that iGPU, and every little bit is going to help out because it's not running in dual channel. In this video, I will run some benchmarks on the 2400 megahertz RAM and the 32 just to show you the difference between the GPU performance. So yeah, it's actually been a pretty comfortable device, and obviously we've got a touch display here. 
We've also got this keyboard button over on the right hand side. It'll bring up that keyboard at any time. And we can also flip this switch. This sets our right analog stick up, kind of like a mouse. So we can easily navigate with that. And I mean, you can get through the whole operating system without having to plug in a mouse and keyboard at all. It's just built in right here. And with the Athlon CPU they're using here, everything's been really snappy from the interface itself to web browsing. I've done some video playback and things like that. But now I'm going to go ahead and plug this into my game capture so we can get a closer look. Okay, so the first thing I wanted to test was the TDP on this CPU, just straight out of the box. Now from the BIOS, there's a lot of settings that we can mess with, or you could use a third-party app to up it if you need to. But uh, right now I've got core temp over here. We've got our power draw, and at idle we're around 5 watts, but I do have some stuff going on right now. Just stress out both cores, and you can see that this jumps up to 13 to 14 and a half watts, and this is just on the CPU side of things. We haven't added any power to the GPU yet. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll just start a render test and check out the sensors. You can see we're close to 1000 megahertz here. This is actually set at around 23 to 24 watts out of the box, which is basically all we really need for this APU to get the max performance out of it, minus faster RAM or dual channel RAM. Our core clock is up at 2.8 on both cores. And our GPU is at 1000 megahertz, so upping the TDP on this isn't going to help out much. I'd say kind of changing that boost time would definitely help out in the long run. Or maybe adding one to two more watts might net you a little better performance. But overall, they've kind of got this maxed out the way it is right out of the box. But I will tell you that adding faster RAM is going to help out with GPU performance. Here's a benchmark I ran with 2400 megahertz RAM versus 3200. It's 3D Mark Wildlife. It's a Vulcan benchmark. 1522 with 2400 megahertz RAM and 2187 with 3200 megahertz RAM. I also ran Night Raid on that 2400 megahertz. We got a 2859 on 32, 39, 36. So this will make a difference when it comes to GPU performance. It's not going to help out with the CPU, but having that faster memory for the GPU to work with does help. Now it's time to check out a few PC games running on this unit. First up, we've got the original Skyrim 720p low, and uh, it's really trying to hit that 60 mark and stay there, but we are dipping under 60. Now a game like this running at high, locked at 30, is probably the way to go on this chip. Next on the list, we've got Half-Life 2. I know it's an older one, but it's still a great game. We're at high settings, and this actually averaged 98 FPS. I had a good feeling we were going to get great performance, and a lot of the time it's well over 100. So needless to say, this is going to handle those Valve Source games really well. You want to do some Portal, Portal 2, Left 4 Dead 2, you're good to go with this chip. And the final PC game I wanted to test before we move over to emulation was Cyberpunk 2077. This game's really pushing those two cores and that Vega 3i GPU. We're at low settings, 720p with FSR set to ultra performance, and it's hard pressed to even hit 30. Alright, so now it's time to move over to some emulation, and while we're here with Dreamcast, I figured we'd go ahead and test that D-pad out. I've got Marvel vs. Capcom 2 running here with the ReDream emulator. We're at 720p, and Dreamcast is going to perform very well on this chip. Amber Nick has always done a really great job with their D-pads, and this is no different. I can pull off all of these special moves here, and I know that some people play with the analog stick, so we'll test that out real quick. I'm sure it won't give us an issue, but these are Switch-style analog sticks, so if you're not into those, you probably won't like the feel. Checking out some PSP using the standalone version of PPSSPP, Vulcan Backend 3X Resolution, and I had a good feeling that this chip was going to handle PSP quite well. Some of the harder to emulate stuff might need to be dropped down to 2x, but we should get great performance. Here's one more before we move over to a higher end system. I will have a full emulation showcase video coming up, so keep an eye on the channel. But the next one we're going to test here is the Dolphin emulator for some GameCube and Wii. And this thing does a really good job with GameCube and Wii. Here's Automotalista. This is my go-to test. It's a harder one to emulate on lower end hardware, and at the native resolution of the GameCube, it's running this great. I'm using the DirectX 11 backend. I also tested Vulkan, but in my experience, I think DX11 might work a little better for certain games. Some of them you might want to swap over to Vulkan. But the Win 600 can definitely run these GameCube and Wii games at full speed. We're going to go ahead and move over to Wii. Here's Tatsunoko versus Capcom. 
And even when pulling off these special moves that put a ton of particles on screen, it's stuck at 60. Yeah, this is really great. I think this is going to be an awesome little GameCube slash Wii handheld. And the final one I wanted to test here was some PS2 using PC SX2. An easier one to emulate, Tekken 5, and I do have some hacks on. Unfortunately, it is dipping under 60, but I'm using the official 1.6 build, so in my next video, I will swap over to the development build and see if we can get better performance with the Vulcan back end instead of DirectX. So far, I've been having a really good experience with the Win 600. This was basically just a first look. It's not my review video. That'll be coming up in the next couple days. I definitely need to spend a little more time with it. It's turning out to be a great little emulation slash indie gaming device. And if you wanted to do some cloud gaming on this, GeForce Now, Stadia, and xCloud work great. In my next video, I will be testing out some more AAA games. So let me know what you want to see running on this. And we'll definitely have a full emulation showcase from Wii U up to Switch. I just want to spend a little more time with this, kind of get some tweaks going, and see exactly what this thing can do. So if you're interested in seeing more coverage on the Win 600, make sure you hit that subscribe button and maybe turn notifications on so you know when I post the next one. If you're interested in learning more about this device, I'll leave a couple links in the description. But that's going to wrap it up for my first look. And like always... Thanks for watching.